how matured and effective are your technology's capabilities in response to growing customer expectations, market disruptions, and a competitive business landscape? How well are you leveraging your technology to optimize your efficiency, your workforce productivity, customer satisfaction, and profitability? Only 27% of business executives reported being satisfied with their IT's ability to meet their business objectives. If you're unsatisfied with your IT, you need trusted technology partners like ActiveEdge to aid your digital transformation journey. We're a pan-African IT solutions provider headquartered in Lagos, Nigeria. In our 10 years of operations, we've serviced clients in Ghana, Kenya, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. We provide cutting-edge solutions across several tech categories. Cybersecurity, infrastructure and cloud, governance risk and compliance, enterprise applications, digital business automation and integration, digital banking and payments, data analytics, as well as software engineering and IT consulting services. Our workforce's competence and experience separates us from the pack. We've partnered with leading OEMs to deliver a wide range of transformative and innovative IT solutions. Our partners include IBM, F5, SmartStream, HCL, Nudenix, and many others. Our client base spans across banks, insurance companies, telecoms, oil and gas, manufacturing, and public sector. To get in contact with us, visit our head office at 4B Utomi Aire Avenue off Admiralty Way, Lekki Phase 1, Lagos, Nigeria. Visit our website at www.activeedgetechnologies.com for more information or send an email to info at activeedgetechnologies.com. Of course, we have with me a section today, our partner does um, uh, IBM, so we are going to be having a very exciting section that will be hand-called by Hamed Afifi, who is, happens to be a senior integration business consultant for IBM Middle East and Africa. Hamed, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Um, so um, uh, if you have any questions, well, I mean, it's actually taking us to this section. You can drop your, your questions on the chat. We pick it up, and uh, at, at, the, at the appropriate time, we are going to be attending to those questions you may have. So, without much ado, I would like to hand over to Hamed. Uh, the whole essence of this section is to share of experience how CIOs are leveraging KPIs to drive their digital transformation and reinvent uh, or rejig their customer experience. Uh, I believe Hamed will do justice to the topic and we can all um, have our thought and rub our minds together towards uh, a very very uh, uh, insightful uh, section thank you so much ahmed you can take over thank you thank you very much thank you for the introduction thank you everybody uh, for joining um, good afternoon to all of you um, exactly uh, as my colleague was just explaining we are here in an interactive session please if you have any question please reach out. I also added um, at the first uh, or at the, my contact, so my email address is there. Is my LinkedIn profile is on this QR code. If you just scan it, uh, you can, we can definitely reach out. I have the habit of, so you, we can connect uh, either by email or through LinkedIn. I would appreciate, of course, if we can connect professionally over the network. So, the agenda for today is that we will be talking about API-led innovation across different industries, not just one industry, and how the API as a concept is leading in the digital transformation world. We'll also touch upon what IBM has to offer. There are different, maybe you've heard different words in the market. We will touch upon that as well. We'll go through a couple of use cases. Uh, hopefully, if we have time, we'll go through a very short and brief uh, demo. But most importantly, I would like to dedicate like 10, 15 minutes for Q&A that will be in the chat and also like a, a sort of a roundtable discussion uh, that we will go. Um, and I hope it's a fruitful session for you all. So 
the first thing I'd like to start our uh, session together is that there are a lot of drivers for digital transformation. There are modern use cases that used to be. Sorry, uh, if 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 please, if we can all go on mute, I would really appreciate that. Uh, so unless there is a question, uh, please, uh, if it's urgent, just let, uh, just unmute and please ask the question or some of the moderators will definitely uh, let me know that there is a, something that we need to address right away. So I was, um, as I was just uh, talking about the digital transformation, there is a misconception that a digital transformation, it's a, pro it's a project. Actually, it's not. Digital transformation, it's a journey. It's a multiple steps across a different path until you start to change the status quo. There are modern use cases that they weren't um, like common or available 10 years ago. Now they are like basics or fundamentals. Think of 10, day, 10 years ago, um, an internet banking, a mobile banking, for example, it was something um, that's really fancy, that's really every bank is competing to adopt. But now, I wouldn't go for a bank, for example, if they don't have internet banking. This is like basics uh, or basic needs that is in there. Moving forward throughout the next decade or two, everything is going into connected devices, connected cars, internet of things everywhere. And also, it's not only the technology is changing, but also the demands of the customers is changing. The behavior, they are expecting better experience and at a reasonable or at a low cost. It's a fact across all the, uh, all the industry. So one of the main drivers for digital transformation, one of the steps that's in there, it's what we are talking about is the API or the concept of API. So let's first define what an API means. So an API, as per the IBM definition, after all, it's a function that serves a specific business or technical purpose. So you have something exposed to be consumed through a defined protocol so that it serves a purpose. I'm exposing something like a service to provide either, either a business benefit to my clients. So for example, I'm offering them to find the nearest store, for example, to me. Or there is a technical capability that I'm offering, let's say, for example, um, a calculator API. I'm offering them something that they can use technically that can help them or can help and as we will talk in the, uh, in the few uh, slides going forward, there is a technical capability that's in there that I'm offering. I'm offering something with them for them to use. It's either a business benefit or a technical benefit. Let me give you an example. So Uber, the famous uh, taxi service, sort of speak, they offered a fair calculator API. And this calculator API was consumed or was embedded as part of Google Maps. So that if I'm looking, for example, to go to um, the nearest, for example, to a, a Marriott hotel that I'm staying at from the airport. So on Google Maps, I just type in the, the hotel name. And then one of the options is that I can call a cab. It's um, for the ride. So I don't need to open a, a Uber, the Uber application, and then I can uh, put the hotel name and start over. So this is what was a benefit for Uber themselves, that they increased the reach, that they are now getting customers without the, without the need for them to first open the application and then type in their destination. No, they increased the reach through Google Maps. And it's a win-win. So Google also benefit from consuming that API that it provides a better experience for their customers so that they can now search for their destination and then 
tag that as their destination. They have the local destination. So once they hit, yeah, I want an Uber ride. It has all the parameters that's needed. And also how much would that cost? So that's a simple example of an exposed API that helped both parties. One is benefited from the reach and the other benefited from a better experience. But are all APIs the same? Are they from, do they all have the same type? The answer is no. So you have different types of API. The first type is public API, something that everybody can access, everybody can use. Like they say, for example, what's the nearest branch from my location? What's the nearest ATM from uh, where I am? So if there is a bank that's exposing that, anybody can invoke that location API. It sends coordinates and gives you where is the nearest branch. A second option is a member API. A member API, so it's basically, again, an API, but it's only accessible through specific members of a specific, for example, community. So <clears throat> we will be touching upon um, open banking as an example, obviously, but the point is that you cannot be part of a community like the open banking community unless you are a registered third party or at least in specific countries. So if you are a member of that community, if you are registered, if you are a legal player, you can invoke that API. Otherwise, you cannot. Similar to that is a partner API. When you have sort of uh, a partnership uh, between a holding company, for example. So sister companies can use or invoke these APIs so that they are not something that's internal, like the private API, but something that we do or share or use with our partners. So there are different types or these are the simplified types, let's say. And each and every API or each and every type of these APIs has its own use, has its own business case, has its benefit and why people would opt in into that direction. But it's good to know that there are different types of API. Likewise, there are different players when we are talking about an API-driven approach. Um, there is no particular reason why I'm picking banks, uh, but I understand, of course, that uh, part of our attendees is from the financial sector, which is something that I appreciate uh, their time and presence. But this does not mean that API-driven is mainly, um, let's say, focusing about banking. It's not. It's just that everybody is dealing with a bank one way or another. So it's, it's something that we can all relate to, basically. Um, so again, to the type of players. So there are multiple types of players or modes of playing that there are different um, that one organization can adopt. The first one is that they offer the, the, the service, the backend services, they are exposed as API, but they are the ones offering the service again to their customer. And this is a typical um, topology, let's say, because basically most of the players, they offer services to their customers. There is nothing new in there. If it's a supermarket or a retailer, then for example, they have uh, their backend system, their ERP, their stock, so they can show each and every SKU that they are selling. They exposed different services as APIs to be consumed by a mobile application to be served to their customers. Another type is that we offer only the backend kind of thing, and we expose that as an API for others to consume and to offer to the customers. Think or let's hypothetically think that Uber does not have a mobile application. So Uber here, it would be the one providing the service. It exposed some of its services as APIs for others to consume and offer to customers. Eventually, you will be using and utilizing the service, but you don't own the distribution channels. A third approach is that the other way or the opposite of the of type number two is that I have 
the consumers and I have my platform and I offer you different services based on APIs that are exposed. The fourth and last and the most dynamic topology that you have is that you are the owner of APIs. You are the connector, you are the bridge so that your customers or even extended customers are using your APIs as well as the service pro providers are on the other end of the spectrum. Think about payment gateways. They don't own the customer, they don't own the backend services, but they connect both. I have a, an electricity bill I would like to pay and I want to pay that to the utilities company in my city. So as a payment gateway in the middle, you, you are serving different customers. Whomever is interested in paying that bill, come around and connect to my service so that you can pay your bill. And at the back end or in the back, behind the curtains, I am connecting to the merchant that you are asking for and I am serving them the payment. So I am the API bridge between siloed entities. So now let's talk. So now we talked about what's an API, who are the players or different type, types of players. Now the question is why would an organization choose to adopt an API driven approach? One of the tools that's, um, that you use in assessing an opportunity or an investment in general is a SWOT analysis, the strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats analysis. So basically what a SWOT analysis is, is that it is a tool that you would use to assess internal factors within your organization so that if you use or capitalize on these internal factors, if they are strengths, so this is a strong foundation that if you use in your benefit, then the opportunity at hand becomes your business or becomes a positive in your direction. On the other hand, the weakness factors within your organization that if we do not take into account, this could be something that you won't like to happen and it's not in your favor. So you need to add these internal factors because they are within your domain of control so that you sort of patch the vulnerabilities so that the competition doesn't win over you. The O stands for opportunities. These are external factors that are in your favor that if you play smartly on these opportunities, you win the opportunity. These are external benefits that if you can use, you benefit from. And um, on the other hand, the threats are external factors. If you don't take care of, they can be against you. So from an API perspective, internally, your strength, how strong your integration architecture is, the way you are building the connection between your different systems and your channels, how can you engage with your customer, plays a great role when you are adopting an, an, an API-driven approach. The easier, the stronger the architecture is, the easier it is to keep or build more and more APIs. And the earlier you adopt the API approach, this develops sort of a competitive edge. And I'll give you an example for this competitive edge and uh, the high switching cost, what does that really mean? So a few years back, Starbucks, the coffee uh, shop, so they created a mobile app, and this mobile app is backed by um, an electronic wallet, right? So basically what Starbucks said is that whenever you want, you can just top up your balance uh, with money on this app, and if you go to any Starbucks uh, shop, you don't have to wait in queues. You can even um, submit your order in advance. So, for example, you are in a, uh, you are running to for a meeting, and you need a, a a cup of coffee. So you skip lines 
and your order will be ready for you because you already placed the orders using that app. And also, you don't you skip lines because you can pay using your credit on the app, and that's it. You take or you grab your coffee and off you go. This has nothing. So as a as a as a coffee lover, I don't know anything about the bank behind the application, the wallet. I don't really know which bank Starbucks is putting its money in, but because that bank exposed that API, Starbucks used that API for it for the for its wallet to back its wallet. So because this bank was early enough to expose that API, it benefited from all. Can you imagine how many people drink Starbucks coffee and they are putting their money using that wallet? So imagine the influx of cash flow that this bank is getting because it exposed this one API. This is what I mean by you have a competitive edge that's in there. And also, if another bank exposed, exposed that same API, why would Starbucks switch its application from that bank to the other? This is why switching cost would be high. It's not something that has to do with licensing or software of any kind. It's just a business barrier. I wouldn't switch using that API to, to a competitor because the competitor was late in the game. And that would take us to the external factors that, and it's very related to that. If the ecosystem of uh, the third parties and the potential partnership is there, the more APIs and the more well uh, and secured APIs that you expose, the more attractive and appealing your business is to these third parties. So remember the different types of players. There are other um, players that do not certainly need to be um, a, a bank, for example, to provide financial uh, services. So there are people hungry for API. So the more APIs you provide, the well documented, the more secured, the more you can provide a value added service. And this will enable you to reach clientele that were not, um, that you cannot attract before. Um, that's why when we were talking about new revenue streams, it, it's, it might be a flashy word, it is true, but this is the reasoning behind it. Why you can expose, and I'm sure that most of you heard that term before, that with APIs, you monetize your data, you, you enable a new revenue streams, but exactly how do and why would an AI bring in a new a revenue stream? Because of this exact SWOT analysis. From a weaknesses uh, or an internal uh, disadvantages that you might have is how will you secure these APIs? So by design, if I'm exposing an API for others, then it invites security into the conversation. I'm exposing something, I'm exposing data, I'm exposing even a server to the outside world to be invoked. I have to take security into consideration. And also, the more and more APIs I'm creating, there must be a way for you to manage it. Otherwise, it will be a circus. So you need to make sure that everything is manageable, everything is secured, and that's internal. And the last is that with a competition, if you are not fast enough, the others will create these APIs. So you need to think ahead of the competition because Exposing APIs is not rocket science, it's not magic, and the low entry of barrier, so the, the low entry barrier makes it easier, not even for big organizations, but even for startups and fintechs. So a fintech can really make a lot of, and uh, there is an example actually that I will show you how a fintech exposing and using APIs can create a very, very, um, big bang and a very uh, strong headache to uh, big corporates uh, coming up. So one of the um, one of the initiatives. So that's based on a study based on um, from from PwC. Um, that's about 
uh, open banking. That's why I added it because in Nigeria, at least, there is a foundation for open, open API standard. So um, it's quite relevant um, that API-driven innovation is, is a big thing that's happening in Nigeria. And I want to also highlight when we talked about third parties and the different players, um, so fintechs, and I'm sure they are picking up everywhere in the world, but these are basically companies offering banking services, but they're not banks. They can be um, providing payment uh, services, they can provide the insurance, they can provide you financial consultation based on your spending, and there are other or a lot of uh, players or different hats that the fintechs can, um, can, can, can do. So remember when we talked about a member uh, API, this is one of which that you need to onboard a third party whereby in, so again, with the example or still speaking on the open banking part, is that you need to register, you need to get an e-certificate to provide or to certify your identity. That should be verified by the bank. So now you are uh, a member. Now you have the proper authorization level. So we determine based on this identity, we determine what kind of APIs that you are allowed to invoke. And of course, of course, nothing can happen without the consent of the customers. That's why you are eligible to call the API since you are a member. So now we have a member API. You are able to call that API, but not yet because uh, you need the consent of the customer. There are specific uh, th or specific rules governing the, um, the the part when open banking, but I don't want to talk a lot about open banking if the majority um, disagrees, sort of speak. But I just uh, I wanted to have to add like three four slides around open banking specifically because I think it's very relevant to the Nigerian market. Uh, question here. I think someone went on uh, unmute. No? Okay. No confusion, Ahmed. Just go ahead, please. Okay. okay. So basically, um, so how do you stay relevant? There are different dimensions that you need to take into account. Um, most importantly is a strong customer authentication. So again, you can see how security starts to kick in. So they ask you, in order to make sure that this customer, uh, we are providing services on his behalf and with his consent, I will need to make sure that this is the person himself. So it's not a multi-factor authentication and off you go, but it's kind of related. So you have to provide something that they know, which is basically a pin or a password, something that they have. So you send some challenge or announce to their device. And lastly, you need a confirmation with a biometric parameter be it a face ID, a fingerprint, uh, or an, who knows, an eye scan, I don't know, but you need to make sure you enforce strong authentication. You need to take into account your, the protection of customer data against frauds, against attacks. And also there are sort of transparency on what can be shared. And again, upon cost and content, everything needs to be cost efficient and also consented by the customer. So one of the, um, if you think again uh, about the, the, the concept of APIs, so one of the, um, one of the actually the leader, not one of the, so the leader of uh, this open banking framework is the UK. And in UK, one of the booming, uh, use cases over there is the aggregated view whereby you log in to your bank or to the fintech application slash website. It starts to talk to all the banks that you are registered with and then it provides you with an aggregated view of how well are you doing and if you need any financial advice. Uh, the most famous uh, and the most dominant player in the UK is Monzo. 
So basically, what Monzo is, it's not a bank. It's very relevant to our um, to our discussion just to let you understand why APIs can be or can deliver a very big difference. And Monzo made a lot of impact in the financial sector in the UK. But even if you are not a financial sector or a bank, but you get you will get the idea and the approach and how big APIs uh, are. So what Monzo is, is that it gives you access and visibility on all your accounts, be it in a couple of weeks yeah so that's this was not possible if they do not play the api game and also it gives you um, a lot of analytics and advice so they are not a bank monzo is not a bank but due to something similar to what we were talking about they were able to disrupt the financial sector big time that if i'm a customer this is actually the best experience I can think of. <laughs> I can pay with any of the credit cards. I have full visibility on all my accounts. I have a financial advisor basically in my pocket. So that's from a business perspective. But how did they do it? It's not magic. It's APIs after all. So now let's switch gears and see, okay, so the API story is quite interesting and appealing. So what IBM is exactly offering in that space. So first, let's talk about an announcement. Not sure if a few years back uh, you are following the news, but IBM acquired Red Hat. So why would IBM acquire Red Hat? Let's, um, let's look at it in this way. So IBM redesigned the way or it, most of its products to, and it was bundled in something that we call a cloud pack. So a cloud pack is, as the name uh, implies, it's a package or a bundle of products that are AI powered. But the keyword here is it's a bundle of products that you need, uh, or sorry, that was built in a very modern way that will allow it to run on any cloud. And the word cloud, make no mistake, it's not only public cloud, it applies to IBM Cloud, the hyperscalers, be it on-premise or a public or a private cloud, or even on, uh, on mainframes. So the thing is that a cloud pack, and our focus obviously is for the integration bit of it, it's a bundle of products. You can see that a cloud pack for integration is, the first one is the API Connect, which is, uh, sorry, the application integration, which is the App Connect, which is the, basically the enterprise service bus or the flagship integration uh, software from IBM, the API management, that's uh, our focus for uh, today's session, the end-to-end -end security, that's the data power security gateway, enterprise messaging is MQ, event streaming is the Kafka, and finally, the high-speed data transfer, which is Aspera. So basically, there are five, six products that are bundled in one place. And they were engineered in a way that they wanted to run on any of the clouds. So what is the missing piece of the puzzle that will enable all this software to run and to ensure that if it works, for example, in the development environment, if it works in the testing environment, it works in the production environment, regardless of the type of hardware it's running on or the cloud provider that we chose or on our own data center in the prem on the on premise the bridge here is the red rectangle over there that's the red hat open shift part okay so and the the main idea here 
that IBM, one of the, the main drivers was there. The, what, and the answer to the question I asked, what makes it run everywhere is containers. If I make sure that all my products run in a containerized way, which means on containers, then it will be portable, it will be scalable, it can work on any environment. Yeah, so what is a container? So a container, it is a way that you package your, your product or in a more accurate way is to break down your product into smaller parts whereby each and every part is encapsulated it's independent on others. So if you compare virtualization to containerization, a virtual, in a virtualization, it's basically virtual machines. So for a virtual machine, you have the host, so the host hardware, the host operating system, and then a hypervisor, a wrapper, ways to manage virtual machines, and then you have the guest operating system, other libraries and stuff, and then your application. There are a lot of clutter and layers over there. The, container, the containers or the containerization eliminates a big chunk of that because you have the host hardware and the operating system. You can guess what the operating system would be. It would be Red Hat, obviously, uh, Red Hat Linux. And on top, you will have the containers. But the beautiful thing here is that if you lose one container, another is spawned automatically so you don't need or let's take another example we have a lot of apis so let's think that each and every uh, application here is an api service totally contained or self-contained there are no dependencies to the other apis and we invented that new big uh, hit api and we need to scale that in the virtualization world just to scale for that api you are actually scaling up all the virtual machines. But with the containers, it's not the case. You can scale up one service without affecting any of the surrounding. So there are a lot of uh, value added when we go with uh, containers. To make it even simpler uh, about the containers, I want to think about so a, a Formula One car, which would represent your application and business logic. You want that to be run, you want that to be to run on something that's sort of disposable so on an f formula one track you are uh, lapping uh, in the race and then all of a sudden it starts training you need to quickly change your tires to the wet uh, tires in a very quick and um, fast way one or two laps down the, the race and then you lose one of the tires is damaged. You need to change that quite fast. So a Formula One car is as good as the set of tires it's running on. The more the containers are standard, nothing is irregular over there. It gives you portability. If you, ha you, don't, you are not locked in with a Formula One, for example, with one vendor, you can choose one uh, set of tires and then you, d you discover that no Pirelli is no good. I want to go for Bridgestone, for example. You can change your, there is nothing uh, proprietary. So it invites openness. It's disposable. So you have the high, avail high availability taken care of because if you lose a container, you can automatically spawn another. And lastly, if you need to scale, as a, the example I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, it is a very scalable technology. This is why. IBM chose to acquire Red Hat for their operating system, but also how will I manage these containers? So I need someone to operate, which is the crew in the pit. Who is going to manage the containers or the tires that we are talking about? That's OpenShift. So OpenShift is an, is an container orchestration layer that's built around Kubernetes. And the main idea is how to handle these containers, you define a desired state. This is, I want three replicas, five containers per uh, API, for example. So each time the, the OpenShift checks on the pods, which is basically the container. And if it's something, it finds something that's unhealthy or something that was 
brought down, it automatically spawns and self yield. Want to scale, you scale on a fine grain level. That's why containers are important. And that's why IBM acquired Red Hat. So you, are, you end up with a container that's managed by Kubernetes and then the host operating system is the uh, Red Hat Linux. And now, if, so that explains the red rectangle at the bottom. I think it's, if there is any question, please let me know. But now we need to focus more on what IBM has to offer in the API story again. So we focus now on the API management part. So when, when IBM was offering the API, so basically we offer it into four different uh, parts, or it's made up if you make like sort of an anatomy. You want to create an API, and then you want to make sure that this API is secured, and you only, or sorry, you, you also would like to manage these APIs because the creating an api it's not something that you would do once and then you forget it. there are versioning over there there is a, a life cycle of an api that you need to govern to make sure that you are really controlling how the apis are created developed retired uh, across uh, the whole life cycle and finally if i'm exposing an api and i'm trying to attract a third player or i'm even trying to attract uh, other developers in the community, I need to provide them with a socialization, uh, sorry, uh, with a social platform that they, for example, they need a forum to discuss the APIs. They want to ask questions and people to respond. They want to read the documentation of your APIs. So you need sort of a portal, and this portal is where your customers, quote unquote, that are consuming your APIs to understand and to consume these the APIs. So in the simplest form I can put is that you have the world divided into three different realms or zones. The first realm is the blue one, which is the internet, which is public to everyone. The demilitarized zone, this is the parameter network or the edge network where you place usually your uh, security uh, measures and gateways. And lastly, the green one, which is your intranet, which is basically your internal network. So if I'm exposing an API, I cannot expose it in the green field. I need to expose it somehow, and we'll see the somehow, in the red zone, which is basically the DMZ. So that's why you need an API gateway. And the gateway is called the policy enforcement point. This is where you enforce all your security policies, or your mandates, or your checks, or your traffic control, so that you make sure that only valid and like safe uh, messages reaches your backend. And also what's exposed to the outside world as well is the developer portal that we talked about. I want my consumers to be able to socialize, to read documentation, and also to know about the different versions and to subscribe to my, to my API. So if we do a quick anatomy, so we have an API gateway, that's your runtime. This is where all the work is going to happen. On the design time kind of thing, you have three other components. You have the developer portal, we talked about that. So you create the API, you publish it, you have the form and off you go. The API itself will be exposed and will be run on the gateway itself. Connected to that gateway, you will have the API manager, which is from where you manage the life cycle of your API, as we talked about, and lastly, the analytical engine that will give you insights about how your APIs are being consumed, uh, the behavior they are consumed with, a pattern, and you can monitor your applications from in there. So first and foremost important part in the API Connect is the gateway. This is your runtime. This is your shield uh, that protects your environment, your APIs. So this is uh, the first component we'll talk about, and it's it's part of the API offering. It's called the data power uh, gateway. 
it comes in a different form factors. You can have it as a physical appliance. You can have it as a virtual machine. You can have it in a containerized way. So there are different form factors that these um, gateways come in. And this is your policy enforcement point. This is where you enforce your service level agreement. How will I serve these, um, these APIs? And also, this is where I create all the uh, security um, policies that I have. To make it visual, this is again something very similar to the same uh, the same picture from the previous slide, but it has the different or core use cases that why or how you would use data power. Data power, as I said, it can be deployed in the DMZ or the perimeter network, as well as some, and it's optional, uh, some customers that I've worked with, for example, they prefer to have a secondary internal gateway to apply internal security as well as to another one on the uh, outside world. Uh, one of my customers also in, uh, in the region, he asked for this physical separation for security purposes. He didn't want to have anything that is shared between the DMZ and the trusted zone. So sometimes there are requirements for two gateways back to back, but it can work with just one. The data power, it serves as the authentication, authorization, and uh, so we call it the triple A, authentication, authorization, and audit. Uh, so that you make sure that whomever is invoking your API is eligible to do so. You also can control the amount of traffic that's coming in. So I have sort of, let's say, for example, 10 API, two of which are very crucial and people invoke them a lot. And we know from our previous capacity planning exercise, for example, that our environment can handle up to 50 transactions per second. More than that, we'll start to see performance impact and more than a threshold of, for example, a breaking point of, let's say, 60 transactions per second, then our systems will start to fail. So in order to solve such problem, which is very common, and I've seen it with a lot of customers, is that you employ a traffic shaping policy, whereby you say, for example, I will allow a, a specific rate to pass, let's say 50 transactions per second. And more than that, I have the ability to reject anything that goes above the 50, or I can queue it, put it on a queue until the threshold starts to go below the 50, and then I will start to consume from that queue. And also I can just pass everything and I will just notify uh, an administrator, for example. Each action has its own business case. I've seen them beforehand. I've seen customers allowing more than the threshold because they were used to charge per API call and then they wouldn't want to reject any extra calls because it's extra money after all. You can enforce message security. You can uh, provide uh, um, um, a lot of inspection that's in there, digital signing, encryption, decryption a lot of um, possibilities over there. I just noticed the time that I think we are uh, running quite um, out of time. So I will start to pick up the pace, please, if there is anything that you need to, um, uh, to ask. Uh, we will go through the questions. Please leave your questions in the chat section. So as an enforcement or a security shield, I just want to highlight that it protects your environment <clears throat> sorry, against unwanted access and also attacks and frauds like denial of service attacks, uh, SQL injections, XML threat, uh, and JSON uh, in, um, attacks. There are a lot of XML threat protection uh, or a lot of XML threat attacks that can be, uh, uh, can a company can be or an organization can be vulnerable for it. So out of the box, the data power provides you with a lot of features just to protect whatever you expose. It is a security gateway. However, 
a common question is that does that uh, make us um, forget about, for example, other uh, network uh, like intrusion prevention and intrusion detection systems? The answer is no. The data power operates at the layer seven uh, and the messaging part, it inspects messages. It can do or it can intersect with uh, some of the capabilities of other uh, network appliances. It has a web application firewall, but it mainly operates on the layer seven part. So that's why, make no mistake, it does not replace, it complements uh, a lot of um, network appliances that are there. This is basically how the data power would, uh, or the API gateway would do, for example, if you talk about security and authentication, it extracts your identity. There are different options, be it a SAML, uh, token or uh, WS security, for example, a lot of options. And also it resolves what resource or what operation or what service you are trying to access. It then goes into two parallel paths, one that decides if you are authenticated or not, and the other decides if you have uh, the resource that you are trying to access. It maps both and it checks if you are authorized. In parallel, it also audits so that you get every uh, if there is an, a very detailed audit trail that can be created as well. It can uh, start routing to the back end based on something that's within the message itself. So based on the content, it can do dynamic routing. It can do some, and it overlaps a little bit if you need some protocol changes. It does that as well, be it a message, a file, or a different protocol. It supports that. And obviously, and this is Hopefully, if you have time, I can show you um, a demo uh, whereby you can see how it can transform one uh, part or one part of a message into the other so that it can invoke a back end, uh, uh, a back -end service. Also, it can do self load balancing. So sometimes you might not need a load balancer behind your security gateway or the API gateway. It can balance to different backends uh, and it provides obviously caching. Um, more around the second component, which is how will I manage the life cycle of um, the API? So the way you define your API, it's web-based. You, you, it's basically you have a lot of uh, drag and drop, uh, click and choose uh, kind of development. You can even test and debug your API directly from the same console if you prefer to do so. Also, of course, obviously you can use other tools like Postman, for example. But the web, the the, the interface for the lifecycle management offers you this capability. You have the versioning, and you have the ability also to uh, create different uh, plans. And by plan is when I'm creating an API and I want to make money out of it. Uh, so I will start to make sure that I want to keep track of what's happening. And also I would like to um, control how many times are you allowed uh, to invoke or call that API. So one of the, one of the charging uh, kind of uh, options is that you can have uh, like the first 500 calls are for free and then you opt into uh, something uh, with money. Or uh, one of my, my customers that I've seen before and implemented something of the sort is that they used to allow you a specific quota and beyond this quota, they keep a train. They don't reject uh, anything that breaches that throttle, but then it notifies by the end of the month a bill to that consumer that this is the amount of API, extra APIs that you call. Lastly, you have the development portal whereby you expose your APIs, the documentation, the forum for people to get engaged. An API portal is something that's uh, not static. It can be uh, customized with your colors, with your logos. And it is um, an award winner uh, API uh, for the, the design. Uh, and believe me, the design and the user experience makes a lot of difference when it comes to productivity.
Um, lastly, the insights, how uh, my APIs are being consumed, who is consuming them, uh, is there a pattern or not, and then you can see different analytics uh, based on that. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to, uh, to, um, to end this part with the IDC um, uh, report, which, uh, which puts IBM as uh, the number one market leader in that realm. Uh, quickly, I'd like to share with you a couple of stories. Uh, first was in the United Arab Emirates uh, with the Ajman uh, Emirate. Uh, so they decided they want to do uh, digital uh, government services. So what they want to transform um, the government services provided to residents and citizens. They had 12 projects. I will only highlight three of them. The first one was uh, Ajman Pay. Ajman Pay is basically, they offered a payment, uh, payment uh, platform that will enable uh, the citizens and residents to start to, uh, to pay uh, their utilities and their bills across um, the whole Emirate uh, through that, uh, that platform. Um, the second was uh, one so that if you are applying uh, to build a new house, um, so usually you need to go into 17 entities, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so you have to talk to 17 different governmental entities so that they provide you the paperwork, the approvals for you to build that house. Um, with this uh, platform, you can do it digitally and you only interact with only five. Uh, so it was a big uh, reduction in the number of touch points. Uh, the last project was, um, it's called Besher. So that this was, it was a, pla a project that will help investors if they want to start up or uh, establish a company. Uh, they can do it 100% electronically and it will only take 15 minutes to get the approval for it. Um, um, astonishing uh, success, honestly. It was, the solution was built on uh, API Connect and App Connect, so the integration platform as well as the API management uh, platform. Uh, they managed to do a savings uh, more than 2 million uh, dirhams, which is somewhere around $800,000 only from this project. And it helped them going uh, paperless to save, they estimated around 200 trees uh, of paper uh, per year. Um, uh, one last story from South Africa was with uh, NetBank and they wanted to uh, embrace uh, API management so that they have better insights on and better services for their customers, which in turn uh, provide insights about the behavior and it helps them understand their customers more. And um, they were able to, to publish uh, APIs really quickly that uh, their CIO, I guess, uh, they said that they published seven APIs in just under one hour. Uh, this is how simple and quickly it is. And of course, it will, after all, affect the way um, the, customer is exper the customer experience. Uh, before stepping into, uh, um, a demo, I would like to have a look on, um, yeah, if there are questions, uh, please, this is uh, yeah. the time. Th th thank you so much, Ahmed. Uh, it has been very, very insightful uh, with you this afternoon. Um, uh, we have, we are the time fast things. We are like 10 minutes already above the schedule. Um, can you do the demo in, in within just five minutes? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So I, I'll I'll just I will not create uh, anything uh, in front of you. I'll just show you and explain. This will save us uh, a lot of time because I want uh, to listen uh, to you and I want to uh, have a lot of questions. Uh, sorry, I want to have a discussion with you. So the demo scenario is very simple. Was you have a client which we will simulate talking to an API gateway that in turn talks to a back end. So this back end, uh, it's a hypothetical CRM. So it has uh, the customer information and we would like to invoke that back end. So we provide it with a, like a customer ID and it returns the customer 
information. So we have here a Cloudant uh, database at the back end. You can see here, here, for example, that you have two fields only, uh, sorry, three fields. One is the ID of the customer, the tier. So basically, if you are gold, diamond, or silver, or bronze, and the name of uh, that customer. We have here three or four of these. Uh, we'll just choose one uh, for uh, our demo. And when we go to the, um, to the IBM API Connect, we want to expose that. So we have that, we want to expose, we want to expose that backend as an API to that client. We are trying to bridge between these two. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to design and define that API. We will call it the CRM API. So when you expose, expand, sorry, this path, I was, the plan was to build this in front of you again, but uh, this is the quickest way to do it, is that we have an API, the CRM API, it's a get API, that gets one parameter, which is the ID, right? Now, on the gateway, this is how you create a policy. So you have this invoke part, it invokes the backend. So we define here at the invoke, the backend URL. So that's the API we are trying to, uh, to expose, okay? So if we go to this, to the postman with this, with the Cloudant, if we give it this uh, user ID and we do send, it will communicate with the backend and we'll get back the Mo Salah record, all right? So that here, we are invoking directly the backend. With this one, with the CRM API, we are talking to that gateway, which in turn talks to the backend and gets back from the CRM the information and it serves back to the client. We are simulating the client with Postman. So here, if we add the same ID and we send, you get the Mo Salah record. If we go with, let's try a different ID, for example, let's take the, no, I'm a fan of Ronaldo. <laughs> so if you take, take that one and we change the ID itself and then you invoke it, now we are talking to the gateway and it gives you back the Ronaldo re record. So we are here invoking the gateway over there to the backend. But before we invoke that, we need to do sort of a mapping because the ID that comes in from our simulator, the client, it has the ID in the parameters. However, the back end with the database is expecting the ID to be in the body, not as a parameter passed with the query. So that's why we would have a mapping. So it's a drag and drop. Remember when I told you, you have a drag and drop? This is how easy it is for you to create. You define your input, you define your output, you connect them uh, with a click of a button with this green line. And then from the postman, the more you, you change the ID and then it gives you back the same result. So we implemented that first bit of the invocation through an API. Also, you can employ um, an OAuth uh, through the security tab. So back to the design, you go to the security, you define that you will impose a client ID and then you check um, with that. Uh, so I, I, this is um, the fastest I can go with the demo. And now over to you, uh, as I would like to listen to your questions. Um, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Hamid. Thank you. Uh, I know we are really, really, Short of have time here. Um, yeah. Uh, we wish you could have much more time for the demo, but that's not an issue. Should anybody actually need uh, have a need for a demo on the call, you can always reach out to us. We are happy. We are very, very much happy to organize a demo session for you to showcase the full functionality of this uh, uh, this highly valuable uh, sort of platform. I will know that it's not, it's not going to be possible to really showcase, I mean, showcase all the features of such a versatile and solution. I have, uh, just to give you an idea, the possibilities, what, what was possible if you are actually looking at an API-driven approach to your 
uh, to drive your innovation and digital transformation journey. So if anybody has the questions on the call, let's uh, now it's, it's time for Q&A. You can actually uh, signify and have your questions or either drop them on the chat uh, box as well, whichever is most comfortable for you. So uh, feel free to ask your questions, please. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, Hamid, a question coming up here from Gilbert is asking, does this mean that you must have ESB in place, does the enterprise service bus in place for you to use the API uh, connect platform? No, no, it does not. The mandate for the API Connect, which is part of the offering, is the security gateway. This is inseparable. But you have the choice to choose, of course, from a physical form factor virtual machine or a containerized form. But this is from an API management perspective. But you don't, there is no mandate, sort of speak, for about the backends. So you can have whatever backend that you would like. Uh, to be exposed as an API. In our, ex in our example, there was no ESB. It was only a database, a Cloudant database that I was querying. I said that an ID, it gives back the customer record. So no, you do not need an ESB for an API management to work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Gilbert. Um, any other question? I have a question to ask, but I would like our audience to ask questions before um, I ask mine and then we can call it a day. So a question here is coming from uh, uh, from Helvis is asking, can this be deployed for private APIs? Um, it's asking if this can be deployed for, for private APIs. If yes, does it offer tracking capabilities or sorry, tracing capabilities for troubleshooting or debugging? Okay. So a private API means that you need to make sure that you authenticate and authorize whomever is invoking that API. So can this be deployed for private APIs? Yes. Can this be deployed in a private or a, an on-premise uh, um, environment? Yes. Can I have, uh, uh, the question was, uh, does it offer tracing capabilities? Yes, it does. And the, the, the gateway, which is, the security gateway, the API gateway, it provides a very uh, detailed uh, log uh, and audit trail so that you can use. It offers debugging uh, uh, from um, that, the, the, let me show it to you. Uh, I stopped the sharing, sorry. Uh, you can see here, You can see here that you can, there is a tab that's called test. And from this test, you can invoke your API, you can test it, and you can uh, click send, and then you can trace the responses. So yes, there is a debugger that comes uh, with, uh, with the data pool. Okay, another question here from Larry is, Adini is saying that, what level of coding is required what programming language does it support? Okay. So there are a wide range of technologies that's in there on top of my head. There is the Node.js. Um, I can find you uh, or I can share with you uh, the documentation that says exactly um, the supported languages uh, that's in there. And also you can have other backends exposed as an API. So remember when we talked about the data power and it can bridges uh, protocols and messages. So let's say and exactly the same example that for the demo that we used, you have a legacy application. It's a database and we need to talk to that database or we have a very old application that was written and the developer left and we are only, the only thing that we have is a web service. 
an XML web service. I want to invoke that as an API. How can I do that? The data power here will be exposing an API to the outside world. This is exactly what I showed you, by the way. The Cloudant is a database. I need to talk to it. And I need to expose that to the outside world. And the, the, the consumer of that API doesn't necessarily need to know how my API is engineered. So you don't need to worry much about the programming languages because you can basically expose anything as an API. This is what exactly what you've seen in the, in the demo. Uh, but you can also have a code that you can write directly, like JavaScript, like Node.js. You have that to be written on the data power itself. So this is the beauty about the API Connect offering. You can expose APIs, but this does not necessarily, uh, or the only option for that, without exposing uh, uh, or worrying about the backend. You can have whatever exposes an API. Uh, I hope that answers the question. And lastly, lastly, before we uh, call it a day, it has been very, very insightful today. Uh, I want to ask, um, that also leads to the question that the previous uh, uh, fellow had about the level of coding required. Um, I want to understand what, what, what level of business tooling is required for this solution. My understanding is that really for any digital business tool, like we have, we have here for API Connect, as we said earlier on, there is a need for you to actually make provision for minimal coding so you can actually enable and empower the business users to be able to actually take ownership of their api driven innovation we don't necessarily doing uh, some uh, hard coding i mean or, or unless it's, if it's otherwise required so i want to know what level of business tooling is provided by this platform to enable proper digital uh, uh, transformation Okay, so it's it's quite composite uh, question, uh, but so the answer is that if you want to create an API, um, again, I created a lot of APIs without writing code because there are sample codes even uh, that's shared in the IBM documentation. Okay, however, the API or the way so i don't expect a business user to expose an api and to be able to enforce security policies to be honest but it takes two to tangle so you need someone um, and this is the um, to have the business driver and the requirements coming in from the business users however with the containerized offering and the API management, ease of use. So there is a, a, a minimum level of skills that you need to be able to create and expose an API. But the learning curve is not that hard. I do not see the typical business user uh, creating an API. However, they can manage it. What do I mean? They can, they know, for example, if you explain to them the concept of uh, the plan, uh, the rates, uh, or the rate uh, control limiting these are the things that can be uh, also in place the the thing about the api so you saw that netbank for example exposed seven apis in one hour which is quite fast um, so from a business perspective the api connect as a development might not be built for the typical or and introductory skills for a business user. However, it offloads a lot of uh, work from the developers. So they can work together in a much faster way. They can expose an API really quickly so that they can have um, a quick uh, time to go to market. So which is basically how fast can you deploy an API from the, the, the time you decide that I will create this API to the time I deploy it. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Hamid. Uh, thank you sure. for your time, thank you for how much you have been able to share of insight today. We really appreciate it. So, um, and thank you to everyone who has joined us on this session. It has been very, very 
uh, worthwhile. So if you should we have any any need for us to if you have any need for a much more deeper dive into um, the IBM uh, how IBM is, how is helping businesses to actually uh, drive the digital transformation and to to enable uh, fast track innovation, we are happy to actually have uh, this section with you. Uh, be it a deep that presentation or a demo of this solution, we, are, we, we, are, we don't have enough time here to really, really showcase all the capabilities of the solution and to align that with uh, your SGOR, the, 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 the typical uh, use cases we have in the industry. So we are happy to follow up with you on this for a demo or a, deep, a, a deeper dive to better appreciate what, how much you can achieve and with this um, platform to enable a faster uh, drive for innov innovation and deliver better customer experience to your um, deliver better, better experience to your customers. Um, in the meantime, we are, this particular session is recorded. So we have the recording. So we are going to be sharing the recording with you all. After this session, another thank you um, offer for you. We have some other uh, very insightful resources to share with you. So you'll be getting a follow-up mail. Thank you for the session and also sharing with you I mean, some other uh, valuable resources that you can leverage to better um, I mean, uh, unlock the value of this uh, platform. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone. I want to also appreciate the presence of our, uh, of, uh, our MD, George Hagu, who has been on the call from, from the beginning of this session as well. George, we appreciate your coming. We, 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 we value your leadership. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I don't know that you have one or two things to say before we close the section. All right, so let me start by appreciating um, those who have managed to make it to this meeting and to thank uh, Ahmed for indeed uh, patiently providing as much technical information as, as he has done. This is an extremely value-adding uh, lecture we have had. Um, and it borders on innovation, it borders on integration, it borders on extens extending the reach of the various organizations that want to leverage API um, uh, technologies to expanding their business and attracting customers. Uh, just like Aliu said, we are very committed to really driving this aspect of innovation as, at, the, at the best possible pace because there's a lot of emphasis on speed. When you do what you do these days, um, affect how much value you get out of it. So apart from the, the presentation we have just had, we are also open to one-on-one -on -one engagement that will enable you to get the most, um, the most knowledge and information required for decision making. So please feel free to reach out to us, make your demands, seek your clarifications, and we shall happily reach back and ensure that you get to where you want to get to. On this note, I want to appreciate you also, Aliu, and my colleagues who have made this possible. I want to appreciate Uni uh, from IBM and all IBM team colleagues who are able to join this meeting and make it happen. Thank you very much to all of you. And then we are on standby for customers who have a lot more questions to ask. The more you ask, the more you get to know, the more you can refine your strategy. Uh, so thank you once again, and we'll stand by to get all those uh, questions addressed. God bless you. Thank you, George. Thank you so much. Um, so that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, we are going to be following up, as we said earlier on, with um, some other insightful um, offers from us. Uh, do have a nice day. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aliu. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.